Hello, and welcome to Learning Music with Pat. I want to start off by showing you a couple of instruments that I didn't happen to have with me on the last two segments when I was showing instruments. So this is a pan flute. It is a melody instrument, and it's made out of bamboo. This happens to be like a two-octave range, and uh, it plays quite well. And basically, it's a series of tubes that are closed on the bottom, that are open on the top, and you blow across them like a whistle. And this one plays pretty well. I mean, it's not the most expensive, and it's not the largest by any means, but it plays well, and it's in pitch, and I have used it in orchestras, although I can't say that I'm very expertise at it. It's something I never really learned how to do properly, but each of these uh, tubes here is one single note. And it does go up to two octaves in a place well. It, it, it's a tied together. You can see these kind of rope-like things that tie it together. I don't know that there's any glue or anything like that, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was in order to keep it together. But it is tied together. It plays well. I've had it for a number of years, and it sounds a little like you're blowing across the Coke bottle or something like that. But there it is, and it's curved. Now, you can get them up to, to be quite a bit larger. I met a man from Concord who built his own, and it was like a rosin kind of instrument. It wasn't plastic, it wasn't wood, but it's kind of like a rosin, which he made himself, and he formed the whole thing himself. But he is a professional player, and all he does is play pan flute. And he came to do a concert on it, and he did a very good job, and he played very complicated music with it. It, and it was really beautiful. Here's the side that you would see if you're playing it. You can see there's a curve in here, and you just hold it up, and you just hold it to your, to your lips, and you blow across it. Now, I don't know whether you move the instrument back and forth or whether you move your face back and forth. I think he did a little of both. Now, I have a little one here. This, this is more like a toy, but it does play pretty well. This is a small one, a, an octave. And it plays, whoop, that one doesn't. And it grows the scale that way. And I think it's in the key of C, but this is more like a child's version, and it's set in. If you look on the outside, you can see that there's a design feature, and, and it's like in, in, uh, there's an indentation there, and the little tubes just go in in the indentation. And I do believe I see some kind of a paste between them, a white paste. I don't think you're going to be able to catch that on television. I don't think it's meant to be too visible. You can see spacing between these two if you're close enough to it, but the others all have paste. And this here, again, I've had for quite a few years, and it's interesting. And I, have, I haven't I have used this in orchestras, but I have used that when we were playing slower pieces that I could kind of adjust myself to playing it. Because a lot of the instruments I play, I haven't had training on. Some I have, the most important ones I have. But this is very important if you're, in, if you're a professional player. It's very important that you get the training that you need. So it's like the harmonica. I don't know how to play a harmonica either. But the harmonica is interesting in that they come, they come in different keys. And one of my friends was a professional harmonica player, and he had a whole case of harmonicas in different keys. If, uh, say, a song was in the key of A-flat, he picked up his A-flat harmonica, and he did very well. Most of the people that I've heard play have one or two harmonicas, and they play it no matter what key they're in. So half the time they're playing in the wrong key, and they don't know the difference, because all they're doing is blowing in and out and getting certain chords, because it's very easy to play many, many notes at the same time. <coughs> Excuse me. What's harder is to play one single note at a time because of a harmonic. You get a harmonic. You have just a very tiny, tiny space for a single note, and they're very small. But you can get some expensive harmonicas. The other instrument I want to show you is this, is the. Um, 
Sweet Potato Ocarina. Now, I've been telling you about the ocarinas, and I brought one in the other day, and it was a squarish. Most of them are squarish or rectangle made out of plastic or wood. Occasionally, they're round, say, from the Caribbean handmade, and you can wear them, and they paint symbols and, and crosses and so forth on them, and they play par uh, fairly well. And I mentioned the Sweet Potato Ocarina. I do not know know where that name sweet potato comes from, but this is the instrument. To me, it looks like a little submarine. And uh, the ones that I have are all blue. I've sent for them, and they don't play too well. But your, your tone holes are on the top, and this is a little, there, a little mouthpiece right there. There's a little slit in it. I'm not sure if you can see it or not, but trust me, it's there. That's what you put in your mouth. And in the back, you have a little place to put your thumb, and you also have a little place to put your thumb in the front. They're not keys, but they're like little indentations where you can put it. So if you put it in your mouth, this here is going to be the labium. This is an extra hole probably to be able to get the music from. And you put your thumb right on that top hole and cover it completely. Then you have all your tone holes like that. Then all you have to do is put it in your mouth and play. See, I, uh, the quality of the tone is lacking. What I'd like to do is I'd like to get an ocarina that shaped something like this because it's not that hard to put it up to your lips and to play it and know that your thumb is right in the back opposite your index finger and, and just have this in your mouth. And it's a small instrument, but if they had one that was made in such a way that it got a really good tone, I would like to have it because I could do all kinds of music with it, all kinds of, of simple music, hymns and so forth. You wouldn't do anything fancy on it. You could do some eighth notes, maybe some sixteenths, but you, you, it's really basically like one tone, not too hard to play kind of instrument. But at any rate, there there it is, a sweet potato ocarina, and I've read that during World War I, the government made tons of these, and they gave them to the soldiers, so when they were out on the field, they would have something to play for entertainment, they could create their own music, and it was considered to be a good thing. Uh, so they still make them, they're not hard to get, but you know, the quality of the tone is somehow lacking. Most ocarinas have a very beautiful tone, especially if you can pay, play a lot, uh, pay a lot of money for it. Sometimes you can get them and they're very expensive, but the tone is exquisite. And as I said before, I've tried to mimic this sound because it is so beautiful on my other instruments, and I have well over 300 instruments between three and four hundred instruments that in my collection. Not one of them can mimic the sound of a good playing ocarina. It's a beautiful instrument even to listen to one tone without an accompaniment. You know, playing a solo where it's one note after another note, and it still has a very beautiful sound. So that's the Sweet Potato Ocarina. Now, uh, we are getting into, and I wanted to go into more, about the intervals between sound, between uh, notes. And so if I take one of my instruments here, and we went into, uh, we will be going into thirds, fourths, fifths, sixths, uh, seventh, and eighth, up to the octave. Now, you can go higher than that. You can go, the intervals can be like two octaves or so, but what I'm trying to teach you is a little bit about the intervals within a one octave range so you can see and you can understand it. You can see a piece of music and you can say, okay, that's a third up.
or that's a third down, or that's a fifth up. And I remember that I did play, and I, I actually created a little song based on a sixth interval. So that's, it's important in the way that you, you understand music, and you understand the range, and you understand what your next notes are. It's critical for singers if they don't have an accompaniment. The instrument will do it for you. All you have to do is finger it right, and it'll jump to whatever note it's supposed to jump to. But with a singer, you have to do it with your voice, and you have to imagine what that what that song is like. You have to uh, imagine what that next tone is. If it's up by four or five or six or down by three or four, whatever it is. And if you're a singer without anything to accompany you, maybe because you're rehearsing a song that you're going to sing and you don't have a recording with you, then you have to be able to, to really judge what the next note up is in terms of how many steps up or how many steps down. Now a third step would be like three notes, so I'll play it. There's three. A fourth would be like this. You could actually count it. A fifth. A six. A seventh, which doesn't sound good if you're playing it together. And that's the octave. The thing about an octave is that the notes are alike except they're in a higher or a lower range. Those are all the same notes, but they're an octave different. So an octave is an eighth up. So if you were to take and I'm going to take this down. I'm going to show you uh, a, a chart. I brought it in before, but if you can see it as it appears on the keyboard, it's going to make more sense to you. So I'm going to put this up. Whoops. It's kind of hard when you make your chart yourself to get them exactly as they're supposed to be. So... Uh, I use my own charts because I know what I want to show, and you can't always get professional uh, charts to show exactly what it is that you want. Okay, so we're going to hope that that stays there where it belongs, and I'm going to show you what these are on the, uh, on the uh, keyboard, and that'll give you a better understanding. So when we get that up, I keep everybody busy around here. Okay, this is the keyboard. Now, when I uh, played the D, I played this D and this F sharp. That's one, two. That's one step. If I say if I want a third, I can go to C, D, E. That's three notes. So I play this and this. If you're singing or if you're in orchestra, then you can be playing those at the same time. But you can start on any note and get third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. Any note you can start on because any note will have, except for the highest and the lowest, will have a third up or a fourth up. So here we have F, G, A. That would be a third. From F to A is a third. One, two, three. You wouldn't play the middle note because you're playing it in thirds. So F to A would be a third. Well, F to B would be a fourth. One, two, three, four. You would play the F, you would play the B. Now, if you wanted to count the notes just to make sure you were right, F, G, A, B. You know, so you can actually see and count that way. Now, if you're looking at a staff, I'll, I'll show you this in, in, the, in a minute, you could actually count it up or count it down. So remember, this is the full keyboard that I've, that I've uh, shown you here, if we can get that up. And then the range for the recorders, and most of the woodwind instruments is going to be from here 
to hear. That's a two octave range. Some instruments only play one octave like the uh, flutophone and that C is right here. That's your mid-range C. This is your high C right here. That's where it is on the staff. This is where it is on the keyboard. Remember you do have a bunch of notes on that are still here on the treble clef and another bunch of notes, quite a few, to the left and that's going to be the bass clef. The flute itself will go one octave higher, but this range, this two octave range, is a comfortable range for most of the woodwind instruments. The flute does very well going higher to this range right here. This C is a C above high C, and the flutes can do it easily. Most of, the, uh, most of the instruments that are woodwinds cannot do it at all. This is about the highest they can get. The flutes can get an octave higher, and the piano only can get from here to here, and the keyboard only can get from this, this last, uh, this last uh, octave. So when you're thinking about playing in thirds, you would be playing this note and this note, or this note and this note. You can start on any note, but it's one third up or one third down, like from C to A, from G to E. And when you see it or hear it on an instrument, you would be playing, that's your third. What if you were to play them together? Now I'm going to use my I'm going to use my recorder, my, my uh, uh, melodica for that. So here's a C. There's your third. Your fourth. Your fifth. There's your six. Now that's grating and it doesn't sound good, but that's your seventh right there. And most songs don't have a lot of sevenths in them unless there are other people playing and it's like an accord. You can tell that this higher note, C, is the same as a slower note C. It sounds the same in a way. Now, if you don't have any musical sense, if that is, if, if music is not natural to you, you might not recognize that. But if you're a musician, you know exactly what the octave is. It sounds exactly, except at a higher range, as a don't below it. And it's seven notes, and the eighth note is the octave, wherever you start, and that eighth note is a re repeat of the one that is below it or above it. Seven, six, and the first, That's the third. And there's your chord, made up of notes of different intervals. And you can make very beautiful music. Now this is a, a honer. Uh, uh, melodica, and I've had it for years, and it plays beautifully, and most people like it. And uh, there are different kinds of them. I mean, I have one that's just like a regular keyboard. You have to blow into it, but it's a regular keyboard. You can see the white keys and the dark keys. But this is very easy for me to use. I can just pick it up and play it. And sometimes I've gone to concerts where they have some kind of audience participation, and I pick this up and I play it. I mean, it's just a very nice little instrument. I've had it for a few years, and the one note doesn't come in as well as the others, but they, it still is very, very playable. The handy thing is you can use both your left and your right hand. And uh, generally speaking, as in all woodwind instruments, the left on top, the right on the bottom. 
So, uh, but the one that I have that's like a keyboard, you would have to put it in your lap, or there's a strap in the back. Maybe if I think of it, I'll bring it in next time for you to see it. I have had it in before. You put your hand under it, hold it by the strap, but if you do that, you all can only play one, you, you know, you only have one hand to play. If you put it in your lap, you can play it with two fingers, or two hands, and so you can get harmonies that way. You can play as many notes at a time as you want to because all you have to do is blow in and hit the right key. So that gives you a sound of what it's like. Now I want to show you we can do some exercises on this. If I take this music, I'm going to take this down for now and put up something else. Now I'm going to play this. And if you watch it, here's your third, D, E, F. And here's your fourth, D, E, F, G. You don't play the notes in the middle. This is an interval between two notes. But if you want to check and make sure that you have it right, you can play all of the notes. This will be your fifth. This will be your sixth. This will be your seventh. And this will be your eighth. So let me play that. It's just, it's just, it's not even a song. Uh, it's just the notes. So I have it though in the key of G because I have that one sharp right there. That puts it in the key of G. It's easier to play in the key of G in a way than it is to play in the key of C. In the key of C, you'd start one note lower. It doesn't have any sharps or flats, but for a beginning student, it's hard to get the lower notes. You might think it would be harder to get the upper notes, but it's harder to get the lower notes. Your fingers, it doesn't require as much air, and if you have trouble with your hands, you have arthritis, or maybe it's just finger stretches that, that are problematic to you, or you're a new student, it really is easier to play on one note up being the D. So let me play this. It's going to start on D, D to F sharp. Why is that an F sharp? Because I have an F sharp in the key signature. Then it goes back to D and goes to G, D to A. You'll notice that all of the bass notes or all of the, the uh, lower notes are all uh, Ds. I've kept them the same. It's the change will be moving up to these upper notes. That's where the intervals become more obvious. So if you want to just kind of look on that, I'll play it from my copy. Okay, so what if I want to go down and start with the upper down? The lower notes are all going to be D as the upper ones were, but going in the other direction. This is going to be your eighth. This will be your seventh. This will be an interval of six, interval of five, interval of four, interval of three, interval of two, which never sounds good together, and also the lower note by itself. Of course, with an instrument like a woodwind, you can only play one note at a time. So the intervals become important because of the fact that in music, as you're reading it, you need to find out, you need to see what the intervals are. Now with an instrument, as I said before, the instrument basically does it for you. If you're a singer and you don't have an instrument playing with you, then you, you have to rely on your perceptions of what the intervals are between notes to be able to get them right. So I'm going to play the lower part starting on this high D to this low D. C sharp D, B D, A D, G D, F sharp D, E D, and then just the plain D. Okay, now I'm going to take this down, and what if you wanted to do a scale uh, that's based on thirds? This is a scale starting off with the D once again, and we're going to do it in thirds. 
So, and this is a good practice. A lot of times when I practice, I'll just do something in thirds. This is the scale. Now, I did it with two sharps. That puts it in the key of D. You have a D sh uh, F sharp and a C sharp. That's in the key of D. And what I'm going to do sometime uh, is to show you why you get the sharps that you do. Why is one key four sharps, or five sharps, or no sharps, or three flats? There's a reason for all of it. And I'm going to show you how to figure that out at some point. But right now, I don't want to push too much on you. I just want you to kind of understand what these intervals are. So I'm going to play the scale, and then we're going to close it because we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll do this now, if you just follow along. Now I did both up and I did down. When you practice it though, if you're not used to it, you'd want to do it slower. Now, if you're a beginning student, it's good to practice like that. You could do scales in fourths, but the thirds are really more natural, I think. Or you could do it in fifths, but you wouldn't have that many notes. So it's better and I think easier to learn intervals by practicing on the thirds. And if you think of a song that you know that starts with a third, that's for example, I'm just doing this out of my head. comes from an actual song and it just goes through those intervals as part of the melody of the song which you can do you can do a lot with intervals and you can write music with intervals and I kind of showed you that last time but we'll be doing it again so we're out of time I'm going to close it here please join me next time <laughs>